Hello everybody, just to say quickly, I'm really sorry that there's a fault on the camera on this video that you're about to watch. So the focus is shifting in and out quite a bit, but I hope and trust that it doesn't detract from what I'm saying. I'm really sorry I can't redo it. We're in the middle of moving house and have limited time and energy, but I trust that the impact and message of what I share won't be lost or detracted from in any way. And if in private life, what has been done must be put right by deeds, not words, this is all the more true in the life of a nation. Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Again, Premier accepts advertising from all parts of the church, which they just so happen to benefit from financially, including Christians who hold, look at this, who hold genuine and deeply held convictions of matters which are contentious. Did you know that you can hold deep and genuine convictions and be completely wrong? Again, I'm dissecting an email here because this man represents an organisation that is number one Christian media organisation for Europe, apparently. I haven't got time or energy to go after little fish. I've got time and energy to speak into a situation which is affecting hundreds of thousands of people. It's going to be hard. Look what she says. It's going to be hard. But we have to stay faithful to what the Bible has to say and, can, and continue to be like Noah, who was telling all those people, hey, God is going to flood everything. And everyone thought he was crazy. But when the flood comes and you're the only one in the ark, you'll be thankful that you trusted God. Hey, God is going to flood everything, said Noah. Said Hosea in chapter 8. Put the trumpet to your lips and sound the alarm. God's going to flood everything. Holy Spirit, we join with you. Greetings, everybody. I'm doing this video today despite struggle because I believe it's important. And my hope is that even if a few people are helped to see objective truth and reality about God and about his people, then I'll be resting well tonight. This week, I saw an advert on Premier's uh, website. Premier is the largest med Christian media organization in the whole of Europe, as they boast or as they claim on their website, I'll show you that shortly, the largest Christian media organization in the whole of Europe. And I happened to see on their website an advert for a ministerial role and the job title or the advert title was referencing an LGBTQ, whatever, inclusive church. I saw the email and, you know, I think one of the things I would say to anybody who wants to know what I think <laughs> is that we must be very careful about becoming softened to the realities of the day and hour that we're living in. Certain things, I think, are demonically and satanically designed to have a softening effect on our inner conscience. In other words, if you see something enough on TV, then sh sh over time you s surely become a little bit softened to it. It's not that big. What's the big deal? It happens all the time through adverts, through content that five, six years ago would not have been allowed, now is. There's a whirlwind coming. There is a whirlwind. And I read the email, I read the advert, and I'd seen it prior to this week. And I think, not that I would have ever had a soft, it just hadn't caught my, hadn't caught my attention in the way that it did when I saw it again this week. 
the largest Christian media organization serving, they would claim, I would say influencing, affecting, maybe even infecting, the whole of Europe. And you have in the job title of an advert a church looking for an, uh, an LGBT inclusive pastor. There's so much that I could say off the off the cuff about language, and I'm going to try and do my best to come to the importance of language in this video. But even in that title, an inclusive church, by definition, meaning there are churches who aren't. And I'm going to show you, I hope to show you, why language is important and some examples about that. But the net result of me seeing this email, sorry, seeing this advert, was just, again, a sense of indignation. And we need to be open to that. We need to be open to the Lord by his spirit bringing upon us as our hearts are set towards faithfulness, set towards Jerusalem in that sense. We need to be prepared to allow him to bring a sense of his indignation or even righteous anger about something. How dare we just scroll through a list of Christian ministerial jobs and see a big advert with a title looking for a LGBT inclusive. So I emailed Premier. I don't know anybody at Premier. I don't know who's who. I don't know who the leadership is. And I emailed them. This was just two days ago. And then I had an email back. The email came in when I was at the gym. I was about to go in to do a cycling class and I read the email and I felt sick. I felt physically sick. I felt spiritually sick. This is not because somehow my conviction or my personal standards have been disagreed with. I felt the sense of the demonic about the email. And I'm going to show you the email. I'm going to, I'm going to expose the person who wrote the email. But I want to just say... In doing these videos, I don't take any of them lightly. I don't take doing this lightly. If there was any sense of hope about a personal private exchange that would result in the changes that need to happen, then I would do that. It would be, it'd be easier for me. I wouldn't have to do this. We're in the middle of moving house. It's a separate conversation to have as to why we're moving house when the prophetic realities of a transcendent objective truth are fleshed out in our lives and that's what we're going to see in the book of Hosea shortly but I felt sick I felt sick at this guy now I'll be honest I also felt angry and I knew there was something of my flesh because I had to turn away from responding straight away I'm not going to respond to this guy's email because I don't think it would be wise. But I had to turn away from responding in the sinful anger of my own flesh. I had to pause. Thank God I was about to go and do an exercise class. So I had time to I didn't have time to. Well, I did have time, but you know what I'm saying? I didn't have time to to, to form a, a respectful email. And as I went home, feeling the sickness of this demonic reality that's in the church, and I'm going to show you that, the language of God, God's language, not my language, God's language. I found myself thrown back again into the book of Hosea. That day, the same day, I had been happening, I just happened to be reading, um, let me show you, Isaiah, sorry, Psalm 81. This is one of Asaph's. 12 psalms that are used if you don't know asaph psalms he was the music director of king david and solomon actually and he penned 12 psalms within the within the book of psalms that were used for communal lament so in other words they weren't just somehow assessing and responding to an individual church congregation i know that we're in a new testament world now i'm trying to use that language to relate with an old testament covenant reality but in other words, they weren't looking at individual microcosms. They were the, the Psalms were for looking at the big, the big picture and for there to be an appropriate response of all of the people of God for that reality. And that's what we're seeing here. And this is my burden for this video today 
as I come to the book of Hosea after I've shown you the email from this guy. Look at what the, the psalm is entitled, Oh, that my people would listen to me. That's the desire, is that the people of God, whoever are truly in Christ, would stop and listen to what the Lord is saying. Oh, that my people would listen to me. And then in verse 8, I've highlighted it for you. Hear, O my people, while I admonish you. Oh, Israel, if you would but listen to me. And then in verse 13, oh, that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. I don't have an expectation of being listened to. That doesn't mean that I shouldn't be saying this. My life, my heart, my mind are before the Lord. Not before men and not before a certain degree of being listened to. This is why when you're being truly led by the Spirit of God, sometimes you will be interrupted in and amongst your plans. That's why we have to say, Lord willing. It may have been my plan today to be at the gym. It may have been my plan today to, to pack some boxes. It may have been my plan today to be with my wife. But he is Lord. He owns me. I'm a slave to righteousness, and so are you if you're in Christ. This is what Asaph's psalm had primed my heart to feel anyway before I saw this job advert for the LGBTQ pastoral ministry vacancy and then the response that I got when I expressed. This is, this is already how the word of God had primed my heart. It's to feel the sense of, oh, that my people would listen. Jesus looking at his harassed and helpless people like sheep without a shepherd. Oh, that my people would listen. Guts wrenched. Jesus could have gone and revealed himself to the harassed, harassed and helpless sheep, couldn't he? He could have gone and immediately opened the eyes of all of them and then they would have technically not been harassed and helpless. But that's not the way it works. That's not, way, not, not, that's not the way the word of God works. Eternally, the Lord speaks what is true irrespective of who turns. He doesn't make everybody turn. He doesn't make everybody listen. But there's a day of visitation, there's a day of opportunity. So my heart was primed by this psalm. Oh, that my people would listen. That's the burden of this video today. And I want to do it in two parts. I want to look at the email that I had back because it was demonic. It is demonic. Sounds melodramatic to you, maybe. It may sound over the top, it may sound judgmental, but it's demonic. It's a demonic stronghold in the church. If you've not seen the T. Austin Sparks video that I'll link into this video, some of the most powerful, insightful words regarding the demonic stronghold of idolatry in the church, where people can't discriminate between the things of God and God himself. Please watch that. It's about four minutes, but it's worth watching. This is demonic. I felt it. And I felt personally challenged from Hosea 3.1. And this was this is really the second aspect of this that I want as a burden. My burden is that the people would listen, but look and would understand. Look at these words in Hosea 3 verse 1. And the Lord said to Hosea, he said to me, he's very personal, said to me, go again, love a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress. Even as the Lord loves the children of Israel, though they turn to other gods. Go and love a woman like that, Hosea. This is the premier emphasis. And this is why I think the book of Hosea is a critically important book for the church reforming in the years ahead. Go and love a woman like that. Go and love a, go and love a church like that. Go and love an, old, an adulterous, whorish church. like that. This is the language of God. This is not the language of Nick Franks. This is the language of God about himself, about his prophetic messenger, and about his covenant people. Go and love a people. Go and love Homer. Homer. Go and love 
Hosea, go and love a woman who's like that. Go and love a church today who are not listening and who are running after other gods. This is a spirit of whoredom that's in the church. And I can only say publicly that my longing, my waking moments are filled with a longing for the church to listen to him. How many videos have I done like this? A time may come when I either can't do them or I'm not allowed to do them or if I'm not even here. But while I'm here and while I have breath in my lungs, I will say what I believe God has given me to say, which is that, oh, that my people would listen. Stop. I pray that Sam Hales, mate, if you're listening to this, before you start to craft a journalistic response to me as somebody who's calling what I believe is false and demonic out about not only your life, but also the, the life corporately of the organization that you re represent into a continent, stop and think. Don't try and preserve. Is what I'm saying stacking up? Is what I'm saying harmonious with scripture? Is what I'm saying, are the words and the language that I'm using harmonious with the language and the words of God himself? Are the words that I'm about to show you from this email that represents the policy of the biggest Christian media organization into Europe, are these words consistent with the words and language of God? That's the question. And if you think they are, then you should dismiss me. But if they're not, you should listen to me. And you shouldn't view what I'm saying as some kind of personal standard. Somebody just said to me earlier today about being dismissive of other people's ministries or whatever because it doesn't fit to my personal standard. This is not my personal standard that I'm standing for. These are the words of the Lord. This is the word of God that we say is living and active and that we say is timeless and unchanging. And yet when it comes to the things of us... We want to be able to just have a little cartwheel here or a little forward roll there and gymnastically navigate a different way and then put it down to a, just a personal standard so that the person who stands on the word of God and refuses to move from that point can be labelled as being dismissive or as somehow expecting everybody just to have his personal standard. No, these are the words of the Lord. These are the words that the Lord used to Hosea regarding his adulterous bride. There's a spirit of whoredom that the church is joined to. And it's shocking because how can you be what well, we know from Corinthians? What did Paul say to those who were prostituting themselves in Corinth? If you're in Christ and you go and join yourself to a prostitute, what does Paul say? He says, how dare you join Christ with the prostitute? It is possible for the church to be wed with an idolatrous, adulterous, harlot idol. And that is the language that I want to show you now. Before I get to Hosea, I have to show you the email because this is the email that I had in response uh, to my legitimate concern. It's important for me to say as well, if I just draw your attention to this URL here, this proves that the advert, this proves that that LGBT inclusive church advert was on Premier. The reason I mention that only is because the day after, even though this email from the editor that I'm about to show you defends their including of that, it disappeared. The very next day, I went to take a screenshot of it and it had gone, it had been removed. Anyway, this proves that it was there and the advert is still live in other places. Um, let me just see if I can pull that up for you. This is the actual advert in question. Here we are, look. Pastoral minister, part-time, LGBTQ inclusive church. This was, this was what was being advertised by Premier and then the next day that had gone. So let me show you now the advert sorry, the response to my email, which was expressing 
I'm deeply concerned that Premier are supporting such unbiblical, non-evangelical antichrist agendas and so on. This is the response from a guy called Sam Hales. I don't know Sam. He and I have never spoken. We've never met. We exchanged emails, I think, in 2018 regarding the Bishop Michael Curry fiasco and the royal wedding of 2018 and this kind of divisive response to that, irrespective of what transpired in the years following, both from the background of Michael Curry's life with Welby and even Mike Pilavacci, whilst he was visiting London on that occasion in 2018, but in the actual marriage of the couple in question. Forget all that. This is where Sam and I had had uh, some kind of correspondence before. So I don't know him personally, but I know that he and I would not see eye to eye on anything, virtually anything. He wrote to me and said, Dear Nick, thank you for writing to Premier about this advert. I'll read it in full, do my best to bite my tongue and then try and pick out the bits that I think are most important. Thank you for writing to Premier about this advert. I understand you feel the advert for a pastor and LGBT inclusive church is inappropriate for us to be publishing and you wanted a response from someone. I reviewed the advert in question and can see that it has been posted by a Baptist church in Leeds. Premier exists to serve the whole church and we regularly give editorial coverage to Christians and Christian groups of all denominations and types, including Baptist, Methodist, Evangelical, Pentecostal, Charismatic, Catholic, etc. Similarly, when it comes to advertising on those platforms, we are happy to accept advertising from the major Christian denominations and networks. Within the Baptist church, there is clearly a diversity of opinion and belief when it comes to doctrinal sexuality, with some holding, excuse me, to a traditional perspective and others taking what may be described more positively as affirming or negatively as revisionist. Please note, I've said I'll try and bite my tongue, but look here, traditional conflated with negativity, maybe described positively, traditional somehow negative, yeah, even though, even though that's the bulwark, the mainstay of the last 2,000 years. Or in your language, unbiblical. Now, I'm going to come back to that issue of language in a minute and the way that Sam hails this guy as the editor, editorial director. He does this. This is his specialism. Now, whether this is because of a journalistic training or a spiritual bent, I don't know. But it's, it's a use of language in such a way, and I would say quite barbed, so as to cast an aspersion. Um, I'm doing what I just said I'll try not to do, which is to comment as I go. Let me finish reading. That means that some Baptist churches will want to advertise for an affirming pastor, etc., etc. Thank you for thank you for educating me about that, Sam. Premier accepts advertising from all parts of the church, including from Christians who hold genuine and deeply held convictions on matters which are contentious. Notice that from Christians who hold genuine and deeply held convictions on matters which are contentious. For example, in the past, we have run advertising for churches who have a theological view that pastors must be male. We have also accepted advertising for churches from churches who have a theological view that men and women can be pastors. The subject of women in leadership is clearly a disputed matter. But rather than entering into that debate and us choosing a side, we, we believe it's important to allow both complementarian and egalitarian churches to advertise with us. It's a side point that they benefit financially from that position. The church in question has deemed it necessary for LGBT affirming to be listed prominently in their headline. I think that this may be helpful for prospective pastors who are browsing our site. If a prospective pastor like you, this is where one of Sam's several assumptions, I'm not a pastor and I'm not looking to be a pastor. Just because I saw the advert for a pastoral vacancy at an apostate church doesn't make me a prospective pastor, does it? If a prospective pastor holds to a, to a traditional view on sexuality, they will know not to apply for that a job. The headline clearly signals to them and this is not a role for them and they need not read any further. If only it was that simple. <laughs> there would be no travail. <laughs> if only it was that simple, Jesus wouldn't have had to go to Calvary. I understand feelings can run high on this subject and I want to assure you and then the end is just 
this bit here is actually quite important. I want to assure you that the acceptance of this advertising does not indicate editorial endorsement. So this advert should not be taken as representative of Premier's beliefs on the subject as a whole. And then signs off and so on. Now, I could take an hour to go through that email line by line. I'm not going to do that for my energy, your time. But I do want to pick out the bits that strike me as being most important about it. So let's turn to it and then I want to turn just to some verses in Hosea. Notice the first thing is that denominationalism is used as a reason. I hope you would agree with me that reading the email, it's impossible to know what Sam believes. It's true. It's impossible to know what Premier, as the largest Christian media organisation for Europe, it's impossible to know what they believe. It's like asking a politician a question. You ever seen that on TV? Where the the journalist or the reporter asks a question it couldn't be any more simple to understand and then answer but in whatever way that they either have been trained or just again naturally bent towards they just can't answer they don't answer the question it's a refusal to answer the question it's a bit like this in this email is that it's impossible to know what premier believed to be true about god even though they're the largest Christian media organisation for the year, what, what, what are they actually saying to Europe? What, what are they saying to Great Britain? What they're saying is what I'm showing you, which is that because denominations have all these different positions, we think it's important. We're happy to accept advertising. And we think it's important that all of these mutually exclusive viewpoints and convictions and points of view are expressed and the fact that we benefit from that financially is just a is an irrelevant by the by prostitution as we're coming to the language of god of spirit of whoredom the language this this is the reality of prostitution is when sexual services favors sexual intercourse or whatever is exchanged transactionally for finance what this email is saying, let me just say to you, what this email is saying in that first couple of paragraphs is that it's more important to Premier that these different viewpoints, these different denominations, regardless of what they say and teach, are given an opportunity to give us some money so that we can provide them with a service. If that's not spiritual prostitution, I don't know what is. It's hardly spiritual fidelity. This is a spirit of whoredom. I'm going to show you specific verses in a minute that I think sum up where the church are at in their slumbering state. He then goes on to this kind of attention to language, trying to cut. And I want to make one point here as, as kind of quickly as I can is he actually, Sam gets something wrong here. He's talking here about the, the positivity and, and negativity of certain words, semantics, phrases, whatever. And he's claiming that the, the, uh, the affirming of LGBT realities is more positive. But actually, that's not what, that's not at all what the, um, let me show you. That's not what the advert says. Look what the advert actually says. Pastoral minister, part-time LGBT, inclusive church. Now, this this might sound like pedantic, a pedantic point to you, but because Sam is trying to coach me on what is a more positive way of some churches, non-traditional churches, talking about LGBT things, he would want to say that they're being positive in saying LGBT affirming, but that's not what the advert says. The advert says they're LGBT inclusive, which by inference means there are churches who are exclusive, which is a negative slur on the church who hold tr to traditional biblical truth. Notice the, 
the character of this email, which is on the one hand to be pedantic and wanting to scrutinize language, but then failing to be integrous at the level of semantics and language. That's very important to see. It's not an incidental point, that's very important. And it's part of the satanic scheme to get people like you and me to be quiet, because if you raise the standard against what the enemy's doing, which is to say this is not traditional, this is unchanging truth, there is this expectation then of becoming negatively viewed as being exclusive, rejecting of people, in other words, being unloving. It's subtle. The Scottish word is sleek it. For those of you who don't understand that colloquial word, it means sneaky, manipulative, knowing or otherwise. That's what's going on here in this use of language. Here we are. So he's trying to get me to understand this and then getting that wrong. That's not what the advert says. But it's still it's still Sam attempting to make out as though this is what's important. And it's not. Premier accepts advertising from all parts of the church. And then he brings in this is this is I found this really interesting. This is one of my other points. He bring he brings in the issue of egalitarianism. I've not mentioned that at all. I could have written to Premier about any number of adverts that promote female elders or female leaders or pastors. He brought it in. And it's interesting. There is a link. This is part of the spiritual demonic bondage of the church. There is a link between LGBT abhorrences, I'm just going to say it as it is, and other areas where the church are just expected to agree to disagree, as though there's no consequence. The, one of the primary ones, of course, being what Sam has raised. Women being teachers, women leading men. And so he's using the reality, unfaithful, spiritually adulterous reality of the church, which is which is reducing something as eternally significant as to, as to what God says to being this. Well, they say this, some say that, and we're going to just include everything because we think that's the most important thing. That is spiritual whoredom. What Sam should be saying is both what is what I'm saying, which is that both can't be right. Someone is seriously grieving God. And to think that there would be no consequence to that or implication is naive in the extreme. And so Sam should be saying that, yes, oh, I can. See, but he's actually using the infant. He's actually using the unfaithfulness to make out as though it's a, it's a fidelity. It's a, it's a faithfulness when it's not. Can you see that? He brings in the issue of egalitarianism. We believe it's important to allow both complementarian and egalitarian churches to advertise with us. Again, they benefit financially from that. That's what they think is important. That's what Sam Hales thinks is important. What I think is important is to get to the bottom of what is true. It is irrational. This is what the demonic does. Satan's work to reduce the people of God, the covenant people of God in Israel in the time of Hosea and the church today to this kind of irrational, can you not hear what you're saying? Slumbering people say this. Slumbering people say, we believe, it, believe it's important to allow both complementarian and egalitarian churches to advertise with us. People who are awake say both can't be true. People who are awake say, even if I'm completely wrong about any issue that I particularly think is right, uh, biblically faithful or not, we should still all be calling the church to repentance because we recognise that 50% of the church are wrong. That's what people who are awake say. People who are slumbering in demonic sleep say, we believe it's important to allow both mutually exclusive claims and convictions to coalesce. It's a form of spiritual slumber and sleep that can only be charged by the demonic. A spirit of whoredom, as Hosea 
will show us shortly. I mentioned about this in the importance of language and in this paragraph, I forgot to mention this. Look, and I'm going to the reason I'm mentioning this now is because I want to come to another example of a piece that Sam has written regarding a woman who was previously a lesbian. And just look at the way he's he's it's a it's a straw man argument. It's a false uh, dichotomy that he's setting up. He's trying to split hairs about affirming or revisionist or whatever. And then or in your language, unbiblical. I'm not going to skirt over this to make a shorter video. The editorial director for the largest Christian media organisation infecting Europe casts an aspersion, and it is subtle, but it's there, that my language of it being unbiblical for God to bless homosexuality, for God, regardless of Romans chapter 1 or anything else, any other part of the script, in my language is unbiblical. Or in your language is unbiblical. See that? This is an addiction with subjectivity. What do I mean? I mean, when it comes to the prophetic word of God. When it comes to the living word of God being brought to an individual or a nation, there is this addiction with reducing something to a personal standard or reducing it to your language. When actually what I'm doing is simply, and as I'm sure most people watching this, maybe a few who won't, but most people will be reading the scripture and just saying what they see. It's not my language. It's not your language. Don't shoot the messenger. This is subtle, but it's there. And I'm going to show you another example of Sam doing this to somebody else. It makes me angry, particularly when someone's giving their testimony, a costly, painful testimony, and he uses the same techniques journalistically trained or naturally bent i don't know but it's there or in your language unbiblical it is unbiblical and you should be able to say that a child of five should be able to say that because god says so <laughs> it's as simple as that and if that upsets you i'm sorry Or in your language, unbiblical. I think maybe just to finish with one other point here. Look at this. Again, Premier accepts advertising from all parts of the church, which they just so happen to benefit from financially, including Christians who hold, look at this, who hold genuine and deeply held convictions of matters which are contentious. Who hold genuine and deeply held convictions. Did you know that you can hold deep and genuine convictions and be completely wrong? People who are atheists hold deeply held convictions that are genuine. People who think you should be able to slaughter babies who are unborn hold genuine and deeply held convictions on matters which are contentious. Again, I'm dissecting an email here because this man represents an organisation that is number one Christian media organisation for Europe, apparently. I haven't got time or energy to go after little fish. I've got time and energy to speak into a situation which is affecting hundreds of thousands of people. You can be genuine and deeply wrong and end up in hell. That's the point. Something being genuine and deeply held as a conviction doesn't make it true. And the fact that I'm having to say that to the editorial director of Premier Christianity should say, should say something loud and clear about whether this is demonic or not.
finally, I want to make this point, and this is where GAFCON are in a similar position of being unwilling to be call a nation to repent fully. Look what he says. I understand feelings can run high on this subject, and I want to assure you the acceptance of advertising does not indicate editorial endorsement, so this advert should be take, not be taken as representative of Premier's beliefs on the subject as a whole. There's so much that you could say about that one trailing sentence, but I want to say this about hypocrisy. They're happy to take the money for advertising, but just to cover his own back, because he knows he's not stupid enough to know that there isn't a large, probably a majority contingent of the support of this organisation who would disagree with the advert as well, he's covering his back on both regards. This is hypocrisy. What does Sam Hales believe to be true about God? Nobody knows. I'm not even sure he knows. The answer to this is the word of God. The main event here is not Sam Hales or Premier Christianity. The main event here is the unchanging, timeless word of God. And as I've said, Hosea, I think, as a book, is the first of the minor prophets. And yet we shouldn't view that as a minor, as in less important than Jeremiah or Isaiah or Ezekiel or Daniel or whoever. The reality is that there's an emphasis in this book that I think is critical for where the church are at. The church need to understand that there is a demonic stronghold of idolatry in the church. In other words, the church is in bed with the enemy. The church is in an adulterous relationship and it's reflected in this email from Sam Hales. It's a blindness. I don't think Sam's there crafting an email thinking, I'm going to do the work of Satan, but there is an unwittingness to it. That's what deception is. The language of this book that I'm about to show you now, and I want to just go through, um, I want to just go through in passing because I'm not going to have time to go through the book as a whole. And in that sense, I won't do justice to it. But I do want to start off by emphasizing about four or five verses and then I'll just pray and appeal. And again, to reiterate what I said at the beginning is that my burden and outcome of this is Psalm 80, is Psalm 81. Oh, that my people would listen to me, please, irrespective of your salary, irrespective of how I provoke you by personality, how much I annoy you. I don't care. But lit, please pause. Please stop and listen. That's the heart of the Lord. That's the burden for this evening. As we come to Hosea, again, this is the, for anybody, and I maybe would just say this to you, if you find yourself also relating with this sense of call to speak into the church from a place of love that will be rejected, misunderstood, misrepresented, and you feel the sting of that, this is particularly true. Uh, it's particularly important for you. Just look at this. Again, in Hosea 3.1, the Lord said to Hosea, go again. Love a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress. I've explained this in Body Zero, and I asked people to think about a couple of different scenarios, all of which were painful, all of which were difficult and horrendous, and yet the third one that I provided was uniquely and distinctly and most painful in a peculiar way, which would be that your spouse, your husband or your wife, went off into the city or town near to where you live and set up a brothel and started selling themselves sexually for finance. It wouldn't mean to say that the other scenario of someone being unwell and passing away or somebody maligning you in the public realm wouldn't be painful or difficult, but that compared with your spouse going off to do that, and that's what the book of Hosea is about, and that's what the book of Hosea is for, is so that as we read it, we don't just reflect on a God who is like that, and he is like that. This is the central part of who he is. Look what God says here. Sorry, it's here. In the end of, um, this is chapter two, okay? 
and I will punish her for the feasts, the feast days of Baals, when she burned offerings to them and adorned herself with rich and joy, and went after her lovers. And look, 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 this is the tender language of God. This is the tender language of Yahweh. And forgot me. I will punish her for, and because she forgot me, declares the Lord. This is the premier emphasis of God. He wants us, the word of God provokes us to think about what it would feel like. What would it do to you as a person were your spouse to behave like that? This is what I was saying in the 1% church video from last week. What does the Lord feel about his bride? As we are now. We know that Psalm 2.8 speaks of a glorious inheritance, a family that he will inherit in the nations, but we're not prepared. Revelation 19 makes that clear, that a people will have prepared themselves. And this is part of it. I want to show you that in a minute again from another verse. This is a premier emphasis of God's heart. And then we, well, then we have this, this central pillar. This is like a central part of what it means to be truly prophetic, I think. The suffering pathos, the divine pathos of the Lord is one who is told to go, like, like Hosea, go again, love a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress, even as the Lord loves the children of Israel, though they turn to other gods. And so then we have in chapter four, these are just the bits that I've highlighted that I think are most in my mind for today. Hear the word of the Lord, O children of Israel, for the Lord has a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. This is the language of a lawsuit. This is a covenant, a breach of covenant. And that's why the Lord has a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. There's no faithfulness or steadfast love and no knowledge of God in the land. There's often a bewailing. There's often a cry for more nuance, less absolute terms, please, Franks. I've done a piece several months ago about the absolute terms of Jeremiah's calling. The weighting of his verbs of pulling down and plucking up and destroying versus planting and so on. And we see this here again. This is the language that doesn't have nuance. There's no faithfulness or steadfast. There's no knowledge of God in the land. This is looking at the whole rather than the individual. We don't look at the individual church and think mm, that's representative of the whole because that's just insane. We come to a critical verse here. I encourage you to, and by the way, if you want to, if it helps, we did a live recording of the book of Hosea and Ezekiel 16, which you can listen to if that would help. But I'd encourage, please spend time reading this pivotally important book. We come to a, an important verse just at the end of chapter four, look here. Ephraim is joined to idols. Leave him alone. <sighs> this is the first reference to Ephraim in the book. We're already at the end of chapter four. And this is the first reference to Ephraim. Ephraim, this is really important. Ephraim was one of the like central prominent tribes of Israel and that is being used in this book to represent the whole. Do you see that? This is not just one small group of people. This is not the Lord stood amongst the lampstands in Revelation and having an issue with one church more than another. This is Ephraim representing the whole. And look what God is saying. Ephraim is joined to idols. Leave him alone. Now, the cross-reference to that verse is Matthew 15, when Jesus, speaking of the blind guides, says, have nothing to do with them. The cross-reference to Hosea 7, 4, 17 is Matthew, I think it's 15, 14. I don't have my notes with me, so you just have to look it up. And, and, it, and it's a cross-reference to when Jesus says of the, of the priests or the religious leaders, they're blind guides, they're leading sheep off the edge of a cliff. That's what God's saying is Ephraim as a whole, look at, they're joined to idols. 
Again, it's this T. Austin Sparks video that if you've not seen, please watch that. They're joined to idols. There's something entwined about the language, isn't there? I think, when I read that, I think of the passages in 1 Corinthians where Paul is addressing pornea, sexual immorality in the church, and he even says on that one occasion, I can't remember where it is, but it's in 1 Corinthians, where if, if a Christian joins himself with a prostitute, he, he then says that's tantamount to the Lord being joined with the prostitute. This is the one fleshness of the covenant people of God with demonic idols. We read it just a minute ago. Here, the Lord loves the children, even though they turn to other gods and love cakes and raisins. Led through the Red Sea, sign and wonder of who the Lord is as the only wise God, and then going after bits of golden calf when you, your leader hasn't come back on your time scale. This is, this is spiritual whoredom. It's a, sp a demonic. And this is the first time that Ephraim's used. And then there's another 34 references to Ephraim in the remaining chapters. For the spirit of whoredom is within them and they know not the Lord. This is not Nick Frank's language. This is not Nick Frank's emphases or particular leaning. This is the language of God. Not regarding the godless nations, regarding his covenant people, regarding his bride. When Jesus comes, it will be for a church, a bride, who will have made herself ready. We're supposed to understand that of ourselves in respect of Goma, who was sleeping around in brothels. And the point is simple. We are Goma. The church are Goma. And yes, there is the redeeming love of God that delivers us from that kind of adulterous, demonic bondage. But there are consequences. Right enough, God told Hosea at the beginning of this bit here to go and buy Gomer. So Gomer, Hosea bought Gomer for 15 shekels. He redeemed her. Again, it's evocative of the way that Ruth was redeemed by Boaz. There is something of that running through scripture. So God is redeeming. He is a redeemer. He is the rock and redeemer of his people. And yet for that to come into fruition, there needs to be a recognition of our current state. Look at this in chapter 5, verse 13, based on what I've just said. When Ephraim saw his sickness and Judah saw his wound, then Ephraim went into Babylon. Or say you might say, then went into the wilderness. Or you might say, and then recognized the church needs need to stop and close. When Ephraim saw his sickness and due to his wound, then Ephraim, then Ephraim began to experience the Lord's redemptive mercy. The church is being closed wasn't judgment in the sense of only punishment. It was redemptive. When we resist and ignore and rebel against that which the Lord is saying and doing, we are turning away from redempt redemption, from healing. For I will be, this is the way the Lord is, and he's revealed himself like this to Hosea, and I think he's revealing himself like this again. And this is not at odds with the cross. This is not at odds with Calvary. For I will be like a lion to my people, and like a young lion to the house of Judah, I even I will tear and, and go away. I will carry off and no one shall rescue. There's something here of the fury. There's something here of the holiness and the judgment and justice and the righteousness and the otherliness of who God is. God is not a soft touch. God's redeeming love is not a softness in the sense of It's a fearful, frightful thing to fall into the hands of the living God.
I will return again to my place, says the Lord God, until they acknowledge their guilt and seek my face. I would say that to Sam Hales. I would say that to Premier. I would say that to Bethel. I would say that to Elim pastors in this country who promote Bethel. I would say this to Gafcon who want to call Welby to repentance about homosexuality, but not egalitarianism. I would say this to anybody who has carried on as though God hadn't stopped his church, his people, dead in their tracks in March 2020. I would say this to any of them. Until my people acknowledge their guilt and seek my face, and in their distress earnestly seek me, I will return again to my place. The language of God, the language of the Bible, not language of Nick Franks. This applies to me as it does to you. Woe to those who, this is the words of Amos 5, I believe it is. Woe to those who are in at ease in Zion. I would relate at ease being with sleep. If you're asleep, you tend to be at ease, typically. And I think that's what the where the church are. We're, we're just most of the church are just sleeping in ease and comfort. I've emphasized this in months, the last year or so. Again, thinking of Ephraim as the whole, it's the prominent central tribe, but it rep represents the whole. This is the way of God. And I want I want to pick up on um something sam hale's piece regarding the hillsong situation um if you go to uh, if you go to this article let me just show you this article um from hillsong and it basically sam's conclusion is that there needs the time has come for there to be change remember this alternatson quote that i said earlier about the need for there to be more than words, there need to be deeds, there needs to be fruit in keeping with repentance. This is the way that the Lord works unto that. When I restore the fortunes of my people, and remember Hosea 3.1, he is the God who loves us like Hosea was called to love Goma. We are all Goma. Fundamentally, we have all been outside of Christ and we've been in that sense the pure, the purest form of adultery when, as the lost world are. But then even in Christ, there is this adulterous bent. We've all been there. And in some way, some of us are, are kind of an entrenched in that more than others. And this is the Lord's answer to it. And you need to see this. The Lord's answer to that is not to comfort. The Lord's answer is to reveal. When I restore the fortunes of my people, and are we not seeing this through Ravi Zacharias, Mike Pilavachi, Carl Lentz? Are we not seeing this on in a repeated way? Mark Driscoll, the guys at the church there, just the, the testimony that's coming from the church time and time and time again is the same. It's the same thing. This, this revealing of iniquity when and God, and that God is doing that to heal us. God is doing that for us to see ourselves as we are. Can you hear that tender, loving, merciful heart of the Lord today? That these things, Sam, Premier, when you reduce the things of God, when you reduce the word of God, when you reduce truth to being this nonsense that your email... Can you not see that it's revealing iniquity so as to heal? Even if, you, even if you had to personally experience leaving your work, leaving your job, experiencing needing to move from your house, needing to, to not know what you're going to do about money or where you're going to live. Do you not see that as the redemptive mercy of God to heal you from this? When I would heal Israel... The iniquity of Ephraim is revealed. I want to finish on this because my voice is going. And I don't know how to say this in any more of a loving way. And sometimes I struggle to believe it myself because it seems 
hard to imagine. The, the people of God have largely ignored him three years ago when the churches were closed as an act of judgment against the unfaithful people of God who were and are languishing at the behest of a spirit of whoredom. And I don't know how to express what I feared in my heart about what is coming upon the earth so as to bring what is needed, which is the division between those who are in right standing with God and those who are not, that the people, the covenant people of God would once again be seen distinctly as they actually are. I, I have no words, but there are words, and again, this is the word, the language of God, that I think comes is the, is the most helpful way of praying in the midst of this spirit of whoredom that the church are joined with. Again, let me just remind you, Four seventeen. Ephraim is joined, joined to idols. You need to see that today. This is the only way I can know to put words to a response. This is the Lord speaking to Hosea. Set the trumpet. This is chapter eight. If you're listening to me on a podcast, set the trumpet to your lips. One like a vulture is over the house of the Lord. I believe that that vulture, that demonic filthy spirit is reflected in the email that I've just gone through and is represented by this Europe's largest organization, largest Christian media. This is this is what's going on here. Set your the trumpet to your lips, one like a vulture is over the house of the Lord, because they have transgressed my covenant and rebelled against my law. And they cry, My God, we, Israel, we know you. There are consequences peculiar. We see this in chapter 5. Hear this, O priests, pay attention, O house of Israel. It's the same kind of alert being sounded. The alarm is being sounded. I know, Ephraim, this is what the Lord would say to you, even if you, with every fiber of your flesh, rage against what I'm saying. This is what the Lord says. I know, Ephraim, and Israel is not hidden from me. For now, O Ephraim, you have played the whore. Their deeds do not permit them to return to their God, for the spirit of whoredom is within them. The only appropriate response is to sound the trumpet. One like a vulture is over the house of the Lord, hence the picture for the thumbnail of this video. It's demonic. It's the work of Satan. It's brazen. It is brazen. Pastoral minister, le lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans queer, whatever. This is mocking. I have no idea how the Lord is going to rouse his people from this kind of demonic sleep, but he will. And you might think this is just the personal standard of somebody who has traditional views more negatively than the affirming, those affirming ones among us. But let me tell you this, that the Lord never negotiates with the smidgen of idolatry. And he will have his bride, and he will have his way. I think his heart is to do that with the least amount of pain and suffering and exile for his people as possible, but he will have his bride. He will have a bride prepared. Coming back to Sam Hale's way of reducing biblical unchanging, eternal, infinitely important truth to just a subjective view. This is not just me he does this with, as he's done in this email. He does it, and he, he did it, I think he does it all the time, but he does it. I want to give you an example now of, uh, he's done this, this is, this is a, an, um, if I just bring it across for you to see, this is an article from back in 2019 regarding this lady called Jackie Hill Perry, who was a former lesbian that Sam interviewed. And if you read the post, you'll see what I mean. But I wanted to highlight two examples where I think this, this kind of 
um, demonic, the effect of the demonic uh, spirit that I'm talking about is seen. It's a, it's a reducing of God's way and God's truth and God's redemptive love and mercy to just a view, a subjective thing. This is the first of the two. Sam is talking about Jackie's testimony, which is the pain and trauma of being separated from a, a person that you love of the of the same sex, but recognizing the Lord's um, conviction about that. And Sam says her desire to be with other women didn't go away. And Jackie has strong words for those who teach that if you come to Jesus, all of your temptations will disappear. That belief is another kind of prosperity, she argues. Now, it's subtle, but it's there. Look, Jackie has strong words for those who teach that if you come to Jesus, all of your temptations... This thought of coming to Jesus and all your temptations will disappear. That belief is, just, is another kind of prosperity gospel, she argues. For Jackie, living God's way means choosing not to have romantic relationships with women. But what does she make of other prominent Christians such as Vicky Beeching and so on? There's this constant um, politicizing or inability just to allow a testimony to speak for itself and for that to be harmonious with the scripture rather than there being this constant in her view or she has strong words. It's in her view, it's just another prosperity gospel that everything just gets better when you come to Jesus, which of course it is. It is a prosperity gospel. It's not just in her view. It is. And it's the same at the end. Sam asks her, does she expect her view, her view? This is the biblical, this is the traditional mainstay of biblical teaching for 2,000 plus years. And this is Sam Hales. Does she expect her view that same-sex relationships are off limits to followers of Christ to be held? This is really, really important. I'm going to finish with this. Does she expect her view, that's God's view, God's language, God's word, that same-sex marriages are off limits to followers of Christ to be held by the majority of Christians in 20 years' time? And listen to, listen to what she says. Uh, and again, this is somebody who is speaking, testifying from a place of pain and suffering and admittedly not absolving her from her sin and she wouldn't say that but it's from a place of cost and, and rawness and pain that Sam is not in I'm not saying Sam is never I don't know the guy but to but you can see the difference Sam is a journalist or an editor for a Christian magazine interviewing somebody who is in a state of trauma and pain and this is the question does she expect in her view that the same sex relationships are off limits to, in 20 years' time, there's a casting of an aspersion. It's like the beaching, Vicky Beeching thing, which is berating the church that in 20 years' time the, the church will somehow hang its head in shame for ever having believed that homosexuality was wrong or not biblical or not, or not um, holy. It's this kind of in, infra, inferring again. Does she expect, have you listened to her answer? I just know that Jesus told us that in the end times, things are going to get dark, she replies. So I think that culturally, our view of sex and sexuality will become more godless and more rooted in our own selfish desires. The email that I've gone through today from Sam Hales, our own selfish desires. And in the church, I think God is going to do what he has always done, which is to preserve his own. How did he preserve his own in Hosea's time or in Jeremiah's time? He sent them into exile. Jackie is correct. She's absolutely correct. I think God is going to do what he has always done, which is to preserve his own it's going to be hard. This is why the prophetic word of warning that I'm trying to bring again today, although today will be regarded as being intolerant, will be regarded as dismissing, dismissive of other people's ministries, as being some kind of obsession with my own personal standard. Let me tell you, when that which comes upon the earth comes upon the earth, when that which is coming comes you'll be glad for the harder word. You'll be glad for that which wasn't dismissive. Sorry, you'll be glad for that which was dismissive. 
of something that just isn't compatible with truth. You'll be glad that my personal standard is the standard of God. You'll be glad that my personal standard is what I'm reading in the Bible. And that's what Jackie is referring to here, where she says that things are going to get dark. It's going to be hard. Look what she says. It's going to be hard. But we have to stay faithful to what the Bible has to say and, can, and continue to be like Noah, who was telling all those people, hey, God is going to flood everything. And everyone thought he was crazy. But when the flood comes and you're the only one in the ark, you'll be thankful that you trusted God. Hey, God is going to flood everything, said Noah. Said Hosea in chapter 8. Put the trumpet to your lips and sound the alarm. God's going to flood everything. Prepare your heart. You cannot prepare your heart with people who are in bed with Satan, demons, idolatry, a spirit of whoredom. Prepare your hearts. Father, I thank you that you use the foolish things and the weak things of the world to shame those things that are wise, those things that are strong. Thank you for the inverted reality of your kingdom. In which we can boast in our weakness, because in that moment, the power of you rests upon us. Lord, I thank you for the truth of your word that is unchanging. And I pray Asaph's prayer that, oh, the people of God would listen. Oh, Israel, would you listen? Would you submit? Would you surrender? Would you stop? I pray, and I pray with my brothers and sisters now watching and joining with me in, in this to pray that the people of God would stop and listen. I pray for Sam. I pray for Premier. I pray they'd be able to discern the love of God in this rebuke and admonition. I pray that they wouldn't reject it. I pray that they would strike them and arrest them in their heart. And I pray that there would be deeds rather than merely words, deeds, fruit in keeping with, with repentance. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus against this demonic stronghold in the church that reduces all of the filth to be comparable in truth, comparable in worth. Pray that the people of God would come to bring pr priceless words to you. I pray that there would be conviction. I pray that people would lose their jobs. I pray, I pray that people would lose their homes. Such is the conviction of eternal matters on their hearts. And I pray that this abhorrence of LGBTQ, whatever, Lord, would be identified, discriminated for what it is, recognized for what it is against your person, against who you are, as you reveal unchanging in your word. Lord, I pray for Premier, I pray for the influence of this organization, that it would be redeemed. I pray that there would be redemption, stories, reports, letters, statements of repentance and clarification. I pray for people at the board level, other leaders in this organization, that they would be cut to the heart. But Lord, in your mercy, you would do that. And that you would lance this boil of subjective nonsense. Lord, I pray that your word and your way would be distinct and seen for what it is. Pray for strength for your people. We feel weak. We feel foolish. We feel rejected, misunderstood, misrepresented. I pray for strength. Pray for the redemption of your bride, the preparation of your bride. Pray for si significant moments of change, preparation, dressing for the wedding supper of the Lamb. We pray for your glory, Father, in the precious, matchless name of Jesus. Amen.